Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we present the second two-part message on why the King James Bible is the pure Word of God as presented by our own teaching elder, John Albaugh. You can find Brother Albaugh's many materials and tracks on his personal ministry website at needhope.org. That's the word need, the word hope, dot org. And now here's Brother John teaching why the King James Bible is the pure Word of God. We're going to need to have just a little back up tonight. We want to cover why the King James Bible is the Word of God. Why the King James Bible is the Word of God, part two. And we want to cover Psalm 12, verses 5 through 8. But in order to get there, I'd just like to have a quick run through on the first four verses. Uh, oh goody. I will tell you in these last days it doesn't matter which Bible version you use. It's very important. And I share this with my kids all the time. What killed the rat? Was it the 98% good hamburger or was it the 2% poison? <laughs> and the answer is it was the 98% good hamburger. Looked good to the rat. He thought it looked delicious, ate it up and did not see the poison that was in it. And that's the same thing with these Bible verses that are running around. They are probably about 83% the Word of God and the rest is man-made errors. And those errors will sink your Christian life. You might be able to get saved by those phony Bibles because the Word of God is contained in them. But it will not sustain your spiritual life. And because it will not sustain your spiritual life, you'll find most of your time of your spiritual life Instead of the Spirit feeding on the Word, it'll be feeding on the messed up Bible doctrines in there, and then you'll find yourself going shipwreck. And if you don't find yourself ship, shipwreck, at least you'll be, trying, you'll be operating the Christian life in the flesh nature, because that's all that's going to happen out of it. And God's not going to reveal to you new truth out of a phony Bible. There's no way you can compare Scripture with Scripture and come up with the same truth if you have the pure Word of God. And you know, um, there's a major difference. Um, I had a little wooden ruler I brought the last time, but I didn't share it. But uh, I got it from Genoa. And it says on there, practice fire safety every day. Now, if we just subtract one word from that, it changes the whole meaning. Practice fire every day. <laughs> now, it's sort of, that's sort of obvious. You change one word, and you've changed the entire meaning of the Word of God. Um, Jill and I had this fight with this one guy that wanted to take the word doulos in the Greek and change it from servant to slave. And once you do that, you change every single word that's servant and make it slave, you've changed the entire meaning of the Word of God, and you don't have the same relationship. There's uh, one guy running around, John MacArthur, that preaches master-slave, master-slave. That's the, what it is. He's the master and you're the slave and you're supposed to be 100% committed. Well, we found out that's the same identical doctrine that the Islamic people teach. It's Muslim doctrine, not Baptist doctrine, not Word of God doctrine. It's not in there. So you change one word. And of course, the funny part, when we had this battle with this one preacher over it, he liked carrying the ESV, uh, English Standard Version. And isn't it interesting, in the English Standard Version, Galatians 4, 7, it says, for we are no longer slaves, <laughs> but sons of God. Why do we preach that we're sons of God instead of preaching we're slaves when his own book said we're no longer slaves? It uh, just puzzles me from one end to another. Um, real quick, what we tried to share the last time that we met was um, Psalm 119, 140. It says in there, Thy word is very pure. The book itself says it's pure. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loves it. When you have the pure word of God before you, it builds in you the right love relationship that you have with God the Father. It's just going to be a known product. The biggest thing we tried sharing is that the King James Bible is the pure word of God, because it bears the fruit of God's Spirit. 
God's Holy Spirit wrote this book. So therefore, if you have the pure word of God, you're going to end up getting the full fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, right out of this book. When you mess with those other books, you're going to have a divided doctrine. Satan promised uh, Adam and Eve when uh, they partook of the fruit that they would be as gods. In other words, they would make the final decision and they would be able to discern between good and evil. And that's what happens when you mess with the phony Bible. You're going to have a split soul and you're going to have good on one side and you're going to have evil on the other. So when you come across a Christian you don't like, according to, uh, I think, Matthew 6, you're going to rend them to pieces. You're going to tear them to shreds if you don't like them. And you're going to find some doctrine in your phony Bible to support that. And that's a, a real shame. But Psalm 119, 140, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth. The other thing we wanted to contrast it to was uh, Matthew 24, 12. I believe it says, because iniquity shall abound in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many shall wax cold. How does it wax cold? Because iniquity abounds. We've found out by the studying God's word that in iniquity is the separation from God's spirit, from God's law, and from God's design. You're totally making a separation from the Lord himself. Iniquity produces lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's in every single person that's ever born in this planet. Vanity is the emotional focus. Vanity, meaning I'm focusing on myself, and who's the Lord over me, I'm going to make all the decisions. Deceit is the cover-up. When a person goes into vanity and screws up, then they cover it up, and they blame it on somebody else. And of course, the last aspect is oppression against others is self-defense. When someone else discovers that you're not what you're supposed to be, then you have the self-defense mechanism that comes in, and you dishonor the other person, you tear them to shreds. And I think we should all know here anyway from the Word of God, the whole gist of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is reconciliation. Reconciliation with God the Father, reconciliation with other Christians, and reconcil reconciliation with the enemy. And that means to bring them to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing them to the cross. Um, the thing we wanted to share out of verse 1, uh, let's see, Okay, out of Psalm 12, verse 1. Help, Lord. Notice the first two words of Psalm 12. Help, Lord. That's the heartbeat of all eight verses. Help, Lord. The person who wrote this knew God the Father and is crying out for help. He didn't say, if it be your will. He's crying out, Lord, help, help. We need help right now. We've got major problems going on. We don't have a plan B. We don't have a plan C. We are desperate right now. We need your help. That's the plea of the person. And how can they cry that way? Because they know God the Father, and they know he'll answer the prayers. We find out here, the two things this person is crying about, the godly man seizes. The godly man. Now, Psalm 12 here is written by David. David was not king yet. There are two guys that was in authority of his time frame. The one guy that was in charge was King Saul. He was originally selected as a godly man, and he faltered and fell big time. All right? The godly man seizes. The word seize means to stop. Saul quit stopping being a righteous man of God and became God of his own life and started doing things his own way. And when he did that, then everyone else underneath him started to tumble and follow his lead. It says here, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. And that's the second area. When those who are in leadership fall, then those underneath them are going to fall right with them. The other guy who was in charge was Samuel. You say, well, wasn't Samuel a godly man? And a man, he was a very godly man, but did you look at his family? Did you look at his children to see what was going on in that department? Did you see what happened to the priesthood? All right? The people didn't even want to follow him. The people says, we don't want God for our king. We want a man to be a king. And the whole nation of Israel went downhill under Saul. 
So we find out that what person in Psalm here is crying out for help. Because two things spiritually that are supposed to be happening are falling apart. We find out why they are falling apart in verses 2, verse 3, and verse 4. And verse 2 says they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. Vanity is another cause of iniquity. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. When any one of us falls in the area of iniquity, we start having a double mind. We have one mind for God over here, we have one, one mind for ourselves over here. And we don't always tell people the truth up front. You guys technically have never seen me before. <laughs> the real me is on the inside. This is just my flesh nature. This is all you see here. But the real me is somewhere on the inside. And I hope by the mercy and grace of God tonight, you're, <laughs> you're seeing the real me on the inside. All right? I want to be as clear as possible. I'm a fallen man just like anybody else. If there's any good within me at all, it only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ working in my heart. Because I have a fallen nature like anyone else. And one of my favorite verses that Paul wrote, he goes, I die daily. Daily. That means every single day Paul had to go ahead and pick up that cross and said, I'm going to follow the Lord. He didn't say, you know, I had a great successful day yesterday, so I, I'll live in my laurels today. I'll just, I'll just have me a good time today, do what I want to do. No, he realized on the inside of him he, had a, he was still a fallen man, and he still had to cry out to God every day and say, God, I die daily. I'm picking up the cross, and I'm going to follow you. And every one of us, we're no better than Paul. Every single day we have to make that choice, and we're going to follow we're going to follow the Lord, and we're going to make our own bad choices and go in the wrong direction. We find here in verse 3, um, oh, let's see, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. We find out there is a judgment against pride. There is a judgment against pride. And God says he'll cut off the flattering lips. When we get to verse 4, it says, For who have said, with our tongue, we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? In any debate I've had with anybody over bad Bible verses, they do not want to be under the authority of one book. They like the idea of being under the authority of 20 books, because if they're under the authority of 20 books, they're under no authority at all. Because who makes the final decision? If I hold up this book here tonight and say, this is the Word of God, and then I hold up this book here and say, this is the word of God. Well, who gets to be the judge tonight? Well, good night, you good people over there. You guys get to decide which one you want. All right? It's not the book telling you who's God. It's you picking out which one you want. God is not like a shopping center. You go in and you go into a food store and you, uh, you pick this one, you pick that one, you pick that. Now, this is it right here. He wrote one book. He wrote one book out of... Um, Hebrews, he wrote one book when it came to uh, the Greek manuscripts. Only one. And as we get into our lesson tonight, we'll find out that he said he would preserve those books that he wrote forever, down to the final line. He would preserve it. So therefore, we know there's a book out there that's pure, that's got his handprints on it. We're going to get into verse 5. Um, so that's just a little brief overview. Verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. I had to do a lot of thinking on this because it doesn't sound right. But when you take a look at this verse in context, in verse 1, the guy's crying out for help from the Lord. He's crying out, Lord, help. We need help. The two areas he's crying out for help in is the political situation was gone to hell, okay, and the religious system was going downhill quick. Those are the two areas he's crying out for help. I can tell you right now, we can look in our own culture and, and we can talk politics all we want, it's going downhill. And if we want to talk about all the religious people, how come there's no revival? It's not getting better and better, it's going downhill. How come some of the most people that we revere right now in high spiritual place in the United States, they don't open their mouth for nothing. There are wicked things going on, and you don't see a single one of them on TV. You don't see any of their churches talking about it. It's dead silent. All right? There's, um, 
A story that Sherlock Holmes is in called uh, Silver, a deal with the horse. Silver Blaze. Silver Blade. Blaze. Blaze. Right, Silver Blaze. Okay. Now, he was doing some investigating in there. The horse is kidnapped. And so he's trying to investigate. Why is the horse kidnapped? And so they ask him, have you come up to any conclusion? And he says, look here, I'm curious about the dog. And they say, well, what's curious about the dog? The dog didn't bark. That meant whoever stole the horse, was in, the dog knew who, the, who, who did it. Otherwise, he'd have barked and barked and barked. All right? I tell you right now, most of the religious leaders that we have on, on high esteem there are in cahoots with what's going on. They're not barking. There's something wrong in this country, and they're not barking. We have every right in verse 1 to cry out and go, help, Lord, help, help, we need help. One of the things I noticed in verse 5 here, who's the first group that God helps? Because verse 5 is an answer to verse 1. For the oppression of the poor. Now who in the world is oppressing these poor people? Any guesses? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Lord. It's the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll get back here. At any rate, though, on meditating on the verse 5 here, we find the poor are oppressed. What group is oppressing the poor? It's the political system and it's the religious system who's out of sync with God. One of the things the founding fathers did with the United States is when they gave the freedom of religion, it was the purpose so the churches could be a balance to the U.S. government. Because the Founding Fathers knew if the, founding, if the government got out of whack, the church would keep them in balance and keep them at where they're supposed to be. And if you guys have noticed, for the last 30 or 40 years, the church has done nothing to keep the federal government in balance. They're kept in their mouth shut. There's something wrong going on here. We're losing all our freedoms because nobody is crying out to the Lord. Nobody is crying out saying, help, Lord, help. They say, well, the rapture is going to come. There's nothing in here. The word of God says when he comes back, it says when the Son of Man shall come back, shall he find faith. He is looking for faith today. How do we know he's looking for faith? Because he is the author. Hebrews 12, 2, the Lord Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of faith. He's putting faith in your heart, and whatever that faith is, when he comes back, he wants to see that faith in exercise. And so, if God calls you to work with the U.S. government to bring them back into sync, then that's the faith you're given, then that's what he wants to find you doing when he comes back. If your faith is to help the churches get back on course and line up again, then that's the faith he's given you. If he's given you faith to work with the poor and help get the homeless off the street and work with them, then that's what he's called you to do. I don't know what his calling is for any single one of you. I have no clue. But he's talking tonight, and he's got a certain plan in your heart that you're supposed to be called to do. So when he comes back, he's looking, oh, there's my servant. They're in faith. They're doing exactly what I called them to do. He's calling tonight. Can you hear his voice? He's asking you to do something, and it can only come from him. That's what faith is. God talking to you and telling you, this is what i like to see done. I have no clue what it is. You may have a ministry of working with the saints. You may have a, a ministry of working with the poor. It says here, for the oppression of the poor, the poor are helped for the sign of the needy. Now, I had to do some more thinking on here. Why in the world is the Lord working with the poor first? And then some scripture verses started coming to my mind. One of the reasons that the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for the poor, because if you notice the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the gospel is go to where? To the poor first. To the poor. To the poor first. Why? Because the poor are humbled. They're humbled by the situation they find themselves in. They are humbled. And how does God give grace? He gives grace only to the humble. He does not give grace to the proud. And so how about that? When we take a look at verse 2, 3, and 4, what do we find out? Huh. That's the proud group. And who's the proud? These are the religious leaders in high places doing nothing except living in a life of iniquity and covering up with the gloss of Christianity, saying, look here, aren't we following the Lord? 
hey, buddy, we got a book here, and this book says you're not following the Lord. He's not. But the only way to get them to line up with the Lord is we have to line up with the Lord first. His grace is only given to the poor, to those that are humble, that's willing to humble themselves before the Lord and cry out and ask him for grace. And the, um, a portion of scripture the Lord had me look at, and I wasn't all too happy about it, because uh, I hate to tell you this, but I was reading one day in the book of Deuteronomy, good night, might have been chapter 8, and in that chapter, I got the impression from God that he included, he, he concluded that everybody is proud. Every single person is proud. And he says, I've given you my word to live day by day to humble you. To humble you so that I can give you my word and help you grow in my grace and in my knowledge. So if he's already concluded everybody proud, then there's not a single person here can say, uh, I'm not proud. And there's different forms of pride. There's an inward pride. There's outward pride. Um, there are some people that are proud that they're not proud. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good night. They're there. In the book of James, um, I think it's chapter 4. I'll just read a little bit to you here. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. And here are some steps that he gives to us. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves to God. And the next part of the verse I find is very fascinating. Resist the devil. Look here. When you and I are in the flesh nature, we're so close to the devil. We're so close to that nature, it totally overtakes us. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So when we submit ourselves to God and say, God, look here, I've screwed up my whole life. I've made a whole bunch of dumb decisions. I've made a bunch of lousy choices. I've been in charge of my life because, you know, in verse 4 of Psalm 12, it says, who's Lord over us? Well, I acted that way, and look what I've, just look what's happened to me. I need your help. I need to start all over again. Can you help me out? Lord, help. First say, draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. What a great promise. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. See the word double-minded? We come right back again into verse uh, 2 of Psalm 12. Uh, with a double heart do they speak. If you've got a double heart, by golly, you've got a double mind. goes hand in hand. Uh, you just can't escape this book, and it says, Purify your hearts. Now, I like to get stuff from the Lord. I don't like reading commentaries. I like just reading the pure word of God and have God speak to me from it. And there are a lot of times I'll be reading along, you know, and sorry, I'm just like you guys. I'll be reading along as about as dull and boring as can be. Okay, I'm going along. Then all of a sudden, something will leap off that page. I'll go, wow, fascinating. In Acts 15, 9, um, I believe it might be the Apostle Paul, and he talks and then he says, and purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. We can have a pure heart, and how is it purified? It's purified by faith. And who's the author of faith? The Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm, uh, let's see, Hebrews 12, 2. And then if you want to have some more fun, I believe it's uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith, faith. And this is God himself talking to you and telling you what he wants to have done. Explain it to you out of the book. So it says here, it says, purify your hearts. How you do it? Get in the book. Get in the book. It's a pure book, and you can purify your hearts. Realize if you've got a phony Bible, you can't purify your heart. Sorry, it's never going to happen, because in your spirit, you don't know which is the rat poison and which is the good hamburger. You're not going to be able to discern, and you're going to mix the two together, and, you, and your spiritual life's going to die, and all of a sudden, you're going to have to take that same spiritual life and work it out by, by flesh. In fact, um, this one guy that Jenny and I was talking to on Saturday, he said to us, he says, he says, ever since I quit King James Olinism, he says, I have the peace of God. I finally have the peace of God. And then he says in the next statement, now I have to work for my salvation. <laughs> How far off track can you get? Now, I like, the, I like what my daughter said about it. He said, Dad, he doesn't have the peace of God. 
He's, he's no, the devil's no longer fighting him. The devil's in a fight with this book. The devil hates this book. He hates it. When I was a young kid, I used to get the dispatch, only for a couple months, though. I'd come home from work, I'd be dog tired. I'd pick up the Columbus dispatch. Now remember, dog tired, dead tired, and I'd be awake for the next 45 minutes. Wow, I thought that was incredible. I could be wide awake, pick up my Bible, in five minutes be snoring. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Gone. So I went to my pastor and I said, what's coming on here? I said, what's happening to me? He says, John, the devil doesn't like that book. He said, the devil would rather have you asleep than it would have you awake. But uh, awake to the world and dead to him. A spiritual battle was starting to ensue. Now, I started using that because uh, if you wake up at night, you know, and you can't get back to sleep. Well, wow, I just get out the Bible, back to sleep in five minutes. Okay? It does work. Now, you say, wait a minute. What happens if you read it and you don't go back to sleep? Then you know what? God's got a blessing in here Amen. for you. Amen. He's got a blessing. Look for it. It's a treasure he's going to give to you at the midnight hour. It's incredible. So, uh, the last verse in here, verse 10, um, well, verse 9 is what tore me up. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Now, I don't know for you, but that has to be self-induced. When we have our sins before us, it says in here, be afflicted and mourn and weep. I, I can honestly tell you, I don't know if I've ever done that. But I'm being challenged to the Lord. To come before him with my own sins and be afflicted and mourn and weep. Now, in my pride, I like to think I'm pulling his leg. All right? <laughs> I'm telling you right up front, that's the way it works. But uh, there is a blessing in here. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And verse 10 is what sews it all together. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Lord, I'm rock bottom here. I've really blown it. Here's where I'm at. And God says, good, I can now lift you up and pull you up. What's fun about that? Is, uh, that's the secret of revival. I was reading one day in the uh, book of Isaiah. We should be able to find it here. Isaiah chapter 57. What uh, an incredible verse. If you uh, turn to Isaiah 57, 15, this is worth circling, underlining. I was reading one day, and this is one of those verses that just pop off the page. Totally popped off the page. I've been around plenty of proud pe pre <laughs> preachers. <laughs> preachers. <laughs> All right? And um, good night. I'm looking at this verse here, and it totally blew me away. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. Now, I already know high and lofty. We're talking past the third heaven. There are three heavens the Bible describes. Between here where the birds fly, that's first heaven. At night time, you look at outer space, see the stars, that's called the second heaven. Past the second heaven is the third heaven, where Paul said he went one time. All right, that's where he inhabits eternity. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. If you want to have some fun, we can still use the same word, pure. I dwell in the high and holy place. And here's this, this just blew me away. With him... Also, that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. Notice that. Here's God way up here. And, and look here. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him that's of a contrite and of a humble spirit. I'm having a hard time in my mind picturing God up here and I'm down here. And God says, you know where I like to dwell? I like to dwell down here where the humble heart is. That's where I want to live. I don't want to live up here in the high holy place. I want to live right here with, where the humble people.